Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 9H, where we're going to continue our discussing of inbreeding, but switching to situations where inbreeding is at least unavoidable and often actively desirable. We'll talk about how inbreeding happens as a side effect of strong artificial selection, of situations when um, commercial breeders or researchers want to inbreed to produce uniformity, and of the problem of inbreeding depression. So one common breeding situation is artificial selection for a desirable phenotype. It could be better crop yield, it could be the um, appearance or behavior of a dog or a cat. And artificial selection is very slow and expensive work. And one way to make it as efficient as possible is to use very strong selection. Only let the best individuals, the ones that are closest to your ideal, produce the next generation. This reduces the number of steps that you need, but a common consequence is that pretty soon all the members of your population are descended from the same small group of ancestors, so they are highly inbred. This may not be what you want, and this inbreeding can expose harmful alleles to um, become part of the phenotype because they're now homozygous. It's necessary to carefully check your population and remove individuals who are not vigorous and healthy. Here's an example of how um, cumbersome, how ambitious breeding programs can be. This is part of a diagram illustrating a plant breeding pedigree that extended for 25 generations. Each of these purple lines is the identifier of a particular plant over the generations. And the white lines show the flow of genetic information from one generation to the next. Now, a second reason for um, breeding programs is to generate a uniform phenotype. So most commercial breeders don't just want to produce one plant or animal that has the desired phenotype. They want a strain that they can breed to produce large numbers of organisms that they can sell. Um, here's an example of a genetically very uniform field of tulips. To get this uniformity over the generations, it's necessary that the organisms be homozygous at the loci that are important to the phenotype. And deliberate inbreeding is the way to achieve this goal. But again, there's a lot of risks of bringing along harmful alleles. The most extreme example of breeding for a uniform phenotype comes from biomedical research. This research needs experimental animals with very reproducible phenotypes because research progress depends on the results in one lab being replicated by researchers in a different laboratory working independently. And this requires experimental animals that are genetically uniform across the laboratories and across time. To accomplish this, researchers have developed what are called inbred mice. They're not just inbred. They're severely inbred to the point that they are fully homozygous at all loci. And this is accomplished, of course, by severe inbreeding. Um, the procedure usually starts with parents who are outbred. That is, their matings have not been controlled. There's been no inbreeding. And they're typically heterozygous at many, many loci. But then this inbreeding proceeds by what's called sib mating. So here are our parents. Here are two of their offspring. You can tell that they're siblings. But they are now mating with each other, brother and sis, to produce the next generation. Again, brothers and sisters will mate with each other in generation after generation of sib mating, deliberately doing the most extreme form of inbreeding. This goes on for typically 20 generations of sib mating. 
And a very sort of immediate consequence that appears within a few generations is the phenomenon called inbreeding depression. Inbreeding depression doesn't mean that the animals are sad. It means that the, their vigor and their viability are low. In fact, it's their evolutionary fitness that's depressed. And, of course, this is, occurs because recessive harmful alleles that were heterozygous in the parents are now becoming homozygous, um, where they are influencing the phenotype. And it's necessary to th then for these breeding programs to include rigorous culling, removing of all the animals that appear to have lower fitness than is desirable to keep the uh, population as healthy as possible. But of course, it's not always possible to completely cull all of the less fit individuals so that over the many generations that the breeding program takes, it's inevitable that some harmful alleles are going to become homozygous. They'll be fixed in the population. They'll be the only allele present. After 20 generations of this SIB mating, the mice are 99% homozygous which is enough to make them very suitable for biomedical research. Now, this inbreeding program has been done with different sets of parents, and there are now a number of different strains of inbred mice available. Here are three called C57 Black 6, A, and C3H. And you can see that they have different coat colors, but they also have different phenotypic properties that make them good models for particular um, medical problems. The C57 black mice have low bone density. They tend to indulge in aberrant behavior. They tend to go deaf. They don't get seizures. They're good at learning. They respond well to tranquilizers, and they like to get drunk. Um, the the um, A mice or have hyper-responsive airways, so they're good models for diseases like asthma. Um, they're resistant to some bacteria, um, but they're prone to um, some birth defects. And the C3H mice are, um, tend to get liver cancers, they don't get um, trypanosomiasis, sleeping sickness, but they tend to go blind. So this, these properties make the different strains Differ, differently useful for different kinds of research. Now, these strains are very widely used, but recently the genomic and genetic technologies have gotten so powerful that um, mouse breeders for biomedical research have done truly amazing things. So, and I'm going to tell you briefly about one of them. So here are eight strains of inbred mice. Each strain, this you can think of this as representing one chromosome from each of these mice, just a representative chromosome. Each mouse is shown that the two chromosomes are the same color to indicate that it's fully homozygous. And each of the different strains is assigned a different color to indicate that they typically have different alleles fixed. So these mice would be homozygous for one allele. These mice would be homozygous for a different allele. The mice are then bred in pairs to generate an F1, and then those F1s are interbred, not the yellow and red with yellow and red, but the yellow and red with green and blue to generate a mouse whose parentage comes from four of these strains. And then these mice are bred in pairs to generate mice whose parentage comes from all eight strains. And then these mice were bred for 20 generations of recombination, 20 generations of normal meiosis and mating, which resulted in many crossovers between the chromosomes that they had inherited from these different parents. And of course, in different mice, the crossovers happened in different places. So the researchers wound up with a population of a thousand independent mice that had, had different um, genetic histories, and so would have different segments of DNA in different combinations from these eight different great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. 
And then the researchers were able to take these heterozygous mice and turn them into homozygous mice. So this strain, for example, is fully homozygous at chromosome 1 and chromosome 2 and chromosome 3, but each of its chromosomes is a patchwork of alleles from the different inbred strains that the research started with. So they now have a thousand genetically distinct but reproducibly homozygous and true breeding strains to carry out medical research on. So we've talked about why we create inbred strains um, as a side effect of selective breeding programs or deliberately to get stable phenotypes, especially for biomedical research. And we've talked about how we can use careful monitoring of the phenotypes and culling to solve the problem of inbreeding depression that occurs in any breeding program that involves extensive inbreeding. Coming up next, we're thinking, going to think about unavoidable inbreeding in natural populations and the consequences for genetic variation that this entails. I hope to see you there.